What does Jesus say is good and bad? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 7. Okay, we're going to get through these three very dense chapters. We are on the third one. And like I said, this is what Matthew wanted to get to. He wants the lessons coming from Jesus. He wants to know, you know, maybe for himself, but he wants us to know too what it is we should be doing for our lives. And Jesus is there to tell us what exactly we should do to live our lives. Still on the mountain, which is kind of the place where people can sit around Jesus and hear him. So it holds more people when you have kind of a hilly, mountainous area for them to sit at. These chapters aren't broken up. In a scriptural sense, these were human beings who broke up six from seven, five from six. So this is one big speech. So then he tells us, don't judge. I think in the New King James Version, I always like that. Judge not, lest thee be judged. Boy, King James has a way of saying something. But I remember back when I was in college, we had one of those street preachers who was out and yelling at everyone. And I said, doesn't the Bible say, judge not, lest thee be judged? So aren't you just throwing judgment on yourself? And boy, he got mad at that. But I don't know that I understood the passage. I just knew how to quote it. And I wasn't a Christian at that point. So now we're going to take a look at it. Because he says, essentially, if we throw judgment on other people, we are also going to be judged in that same measure. What does that mean? But now he goes on to see that if we see something wrong, he calls it a speck in our brother's eye. Again, remember, the eyes were the windows to the soul about how we see light and dark. That was the analogy before. But we have a log in our eye. So that's pretty ridiculous. We can't get a log into our eye. But that's the idea is we're seeing something minor going wrong with our brother, and yet we have something majorly wrong in our own eye. How can we go to our brother and complain about this speck? He says, first, we should take the log out of our own eye, take that big darkness, that big sin, the place that we're looking at things the wrong way. And then once we take it out, we'll be able to see our brother's speck more clearly. So looking about this, does that mean we don't judge? We should test every spirit. We should know what God wants us to do. We should not allow people to drag us away from what God wants to do. But what is that judgment then? What does it mean? Someone brought out that this is a judge not. It's not a you will be condemned and thrown into the fire if you judge. It just means that if you start judging other people, you're going to come across this yourself. So it's not an absolute forbidding of judging. But instead, it's saying you're going to be looked at too. And if you have a log in your eye, you're going to be in trouble. And it also brings up the point that when we talk about people's sins or what they're doing or what we see going wrong in their lives, it's always done inside of humility. We don't know what that other person is thinking. You know, we see mind reading all the time. Oh, you see those people over there? They just think blah, blah, blah. And we think we can mind read. We can't mind read. You can't go through and judge what is going on inside of a person, why they have picked the things they've picked. We only know about certain actions. And I always think of it as that all actions, all things either take us towards God or away from God. In this case, you know, when we recognize something that takes people away from God, certainly saying the truth about that is not judging as it is helping someone instruct them. You got to be careful about this. And if you have questions about whether or not you should say things to other people about their sin, you should talk to a pastor about that. But then when we look at this too, that God calls us to righteousness. He calls everyone to righteousness. But in that same breath, then tells us not to judge other people. And David Guzik writes a great commentary. It's online. You can find it. This is essentially his life of sermon notes that he wrote for himself. And then he ended up saying, wow, that's pretty good. So it's available online. It's also available in Logos if you want to get it that way. But he said that whenever we are thinking the worst of other people, whenever we're speaking about that person to other people, like speaking badly about them, when we judge other people's lives by what he calls their worst moments, when we think we can know what their hidden motives, what their inner guts are, And if we judge them or look at what they're doing without taking into consideration the things we're doing, we're breaking this commandment. If we were to judge someone, it has to be done in a way that we would also want to be judged. 
If we don't want that kind of heat, and if we can't take that kind of heat, we're not the right vessel for it. So this is a very wordy one, but essentially it goes into the whole line. Mercy is given to the merciful, forgiveness to the forgiving. And now judging is going to come to the judges. So if you're sitting there and telling someone they're screwing up their lives, meanwhile, you're going off and doing X, Y, and Z, prepare to be judged. He says, don't uh, give to dogs. Oh, I like dogs. What is holy? Or throw your pearls before swines or pigs, you know, because they're just going to treat it. They're going to step on it and throw it into the mud. They don't care about the things that are good. And so when you're giving these pearls, these gems of things to the dogs and the pigs, they don't care about it. They can't eat it. They're just going to stomp on it. It's no good. You know, pigs, certainly unkosher, unclean animals, dogs too. So we understand that the area and the time dogs were gross. You know, they were living in the dumps. They were living and eating off of garbage and then they were un generally unclean and pigs will eat anything. They roll around in the mud. And so he's saying at this point, don't give valuable things to people who are going to trash them. We, of course, preach the gospel to everyone. But when people, they, they say, hardened, are rejecting, are being representatives of evil, it's, it's doing no good. You're not getting anywhere with them. We come before someone who is so hardened, is so far from the truth, that giving the word of God, the gospel, to people who would dishonor it in such a way, we have to go back and pray. Pray for them so that they will be at a point where they'll be able to hear the word of God. I think I was at that point, certainly in high school. I didn't hate religion and I didn't hate people who were religious, but I thought, okay, if you need that kind of thing, go for it. But I don't need that kind of thing. And when my heart changed on it, my friend witnessed to me and the message got through. She brought me to her pastor and I heard that message. So at some point, I was a swine before pearls. I was rejecting it, found no interest in it, didn't need it, didn't want it. But eventually I came through. I think other people can too, and that's where we pray for them. Then it goes on to saying, ask and it'll be given. Look and you'll find it. Knock and the door will be open to you. And everyone who asks for things receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. So he says that same phrase over twice. And he says, if you had a son who wanted bread, would you give him a stone? There's a stone again. Or if he wanted a fish, would you give him a serpent? And he's saying to all the people there, if you know how and you're living in evil, meaning all of us, we are all living in evil because we have not the ability to live the good life that God wants us to do, although we try. And if we can figure out how to give good gifts to our children, what about the perfect God in heaven? Doesn't he know how to give a great gift? And he does. And not only that, he can see in the whole scheme of thing what is best for us. I think what I like about this chapter more than anything, this ask, seek, knock, is done in the imperative language. Again, this is prescriptive. We should do these things, and we're supposed to pray. The idea is that all these people don't act to get what they want, but it's God who brings those things to us. We have to ask, seek, knock. We have to do intro, that opening place so that we can ask God in our prayers for the things we need to do. And someone said too, this is a progressive intensity. These are getting stronger. First you ask, then you go looking for it, and then you knock. I want this thing. Hey, let me in. You know, it brings us to the door of God and tells us, let us in. So I like this. I like this passage a lot, and I forget it oftentimes. And Charles Spurgeon said it this way, his doors are meant to open. They were made for a purpose, which is entrance. And so is the blessed gospel of God, is made on purpose for us to enter into life and peace. It would be of no use to knock at a wall, but you wisely knock at a door, for it is arranged to be opened. Charles Spurgeon really put it a very nice way. And so it just reminds us that we should ask God for the things that we need. And I don't know, you know, sometimes I feel weird about it, like, I understand praying for peace and praying for people to learn about God. Sometimes it strikes me petty when I say, man, God, I could really use a new roof. It'd be nice if I could have a new roof. Please help me. But I, you know, I do it because God asks us to do it. But somehow I feel weird about it 
And God is saying, don't feel weird about it. Ask for what you need. And if we who are sinners on earth can figure out how to give a good gift, God is going to do an even better job. Then comes what is called the golden rule. We've heard this before. And people rightly call it the summary of the law and the prophets. Again, it's that we're going to treat other people like we want to be treated. We're going to have mercy when we want mercy. We're going to have forgiveness when we want forgiveness. And we're going to not judge when we don't want to be judged. So instead of turning it around and saying, don't judge when you don't want to be judged, he's bringing it into a positive and saying, do to people how you would want to be done. It, it always adds that a reflection. If we try to reach out to people, people will reach out to us. If we try to shut people down, we'll get shut out. I mean, it, it goes both directions. And so we should think about how treating other people like we would want to be treated is the better way. And people feel like this golden rule is like a summary of everything that God has just said. In the end, we should treat other people like we want to be treated. And he's not even saying, you will get treated that way if you do it. Sometimes we treat people with kindness and we get treated poorly back. Sometimes we treat people meanly and they treat us back in kindness. It's not always a one for one, but instead that intention should be that you should treat people as you wish to be treated, whether or not you're going to get it. And we see in a lot of cases, Jesus spoke calmly to people. He spoke in love to people. He instructed to people. Is in the end that how he got treated? No, not at all. So we still should do it, even though we may not get the desire we want. But we should in all things think about how people want to be treated and treat them that way. We are perfecting this in Jesus. This isn't just give money so you get money. This isn't a let your children do everything so they'll let you do everything. We're supposed to be looking at this through God's word, through righteousness. He goes on then to talk about the narrow gate and few people find it. So this is about, you know, entering the kingdom of heaven. This is about doing the hard thing that pays off in the end. God is saying that we only enter the kingdom of heaven through this narrow gate not the wide gate that everyone else is going through. That wide gate leads to destruction. I think that's, in my mind, where it talks about mourning. When I see the world go in through the wide gate, doing all the things that all the people always do, and knowing that it leads to destruction. People generally talk about it as, this is not a prescription of telling people who don't believe in Jesus to, to believe in Jesus. This is a call to people who do believe to then walk that narrow path, to keep walking that narrow path and go into the narrow gate. And so it brings to us this idea that not all lifestyles are equally good. I joke about the phrase, you be you, boo-boo, and I mean it in a sense of, if you want to decorate your house in all purple, you be you. I don't mean it in a sense of the way we should live overall. God doesn't say, you be you, boo-boo. He is telling us there is a path and you should follow it. It's difficult, but it leads to everlasting life. He's not saying that the life, that the narrow gate is a good suggestion. He is saying this is the way to life. This is the way you should live. This is the way you must live. It's a narrow gate. It is difficult. And that Bob Guzak fellow was talking about, he says, if your road has a gate that is easy and well-traveled, you would do well to look out. Then he goes on to talk about the fruit again. We talked about the fruit before where the ax was at the base of the tree. John said, we can tell people by their fruit that they produced. And he says, now as a warning, be wary of false prophets. People who think they're doing you a favor they are wolves in sheep's clothing, meaning they are scavengers dressed up to look nice. But we will see them by the fruits they produced. He says, are they gathering grapes from the thorn bushes or figs from the thistles? No, they are not. So we can't see at the core of what's going on with people. When we look at someone who's telling us this story about how we should live or how we should act or what we should do, and their fruits are that of sin, are that of evil, it's a bad fruit. What fruit are they producing? And that's where we can tell. Again, because we cannot look into the souls of people. And just like I can't look at the tree that's in my backyard, 
and tell whether or not it's a good tree, whether there's rot in the center of the tree. I can't tell until I chop it down to see if there's rot in there. All I can do is look to see what it's producing. And then he says a a hard thing at the very, we're coming towards the end, where he says not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, meaning calls out to his name, are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But it's the people who does the will of his father. He said that people will come and say, hey, we prophesied, we cast out demons, we did mighty works in your name. And I'll say, you know what? I never knew you and go away. You workers of lawlessness. If you look at other interpretations, NASB says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is a warning to people that we just can't live life of hypocrites. I think that's where he calls a lot of the Pharisees hypocrites because they're trying to do the will of God. They're trying to look holy and pray out loud and give tons of money, but their inside is rotten. They're not producing good fruits. And so that people will come to God and say, hey, I was on your side all the time. I've been preaching your word. I'm doing all the things. I cast out demons. I did all this work. And he's saying, that's not what's in the inside of you. You are hypocrites. You were doing outside shows and living an entirely different life. And this is probably going to come to a shock of all the scribes and rabbis who were there. We're doing your thing. We're living your life. We're going the direction you want us to go. And now you're telling us we're not even going to get to the kingdom of heaven. And you're going to say you didn't even know us. And then he tells them to leave. I mean, this is kind of a dark situation. God knows the heart and he knows whether they meant it. They meant to love God, they meant to honor righteousness, or if they were just doing things to put on a show. So that is sobering indeed. And then we get to the one that I've heard a lot about. I like this passage. I think this was at my friend's wedding. He says that everyone that hears what he's saying, the word of God, is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And that means, you know, that it can withstand everything, the the storm that's about to come when we live with Jesus, we know there's a storm out there. We know that we're going to get hit with it. And so in this case, we build on that firm rock, we will have a firm house that will be able to withstand everything. And another analogy is something we understand, but when we build on sand, it's going to disintegrate. The thing that we thought was going to offer us protection can't protect us. We're going to build our lives on the rock that matters, which is Jesus. We're not going to put our foundation of our lives on the sayings of other people, the misunderstandings of the way that we should live our lives, about these rules around rules that are wrong in many cases, but instead we're going to put them solidly on Jesus. So whatever storms may come our way, we have that foundation. We are built for the storm personally. And I can't think of anything better than what is said right there. First of all, Hardship comes to everybody. And do we have that faith in Christ alone to give us what we need in order to get over that? Or are we going to get blown around, thrown down to the ground? And that's where we have to rebuild the very foundations of our lives. Having Christ is not about a cloak we're putting on the outside of us. This is about building us on top of a rock. We're rebuilding our organization. That's not to say, too, like if something happens bad in my life, I'm not shaken by it. Of course I am. But the question is, is do we still rely on God and count on him to protect us during this storm? Help us to get over this horrible thing. Or are we going to crumble the first time something happens to us? I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves. And then if we don't feel that we're built on that foundation of rock, We need to talk to someone about how to get back there. And then at the very end of this chapter, Jesus said these sayings, the crowd was astonished, meaning they were up there with them. This was on a secret message he was just giving to his apostles. Everybody was there and they realized that he had authority and he wasn't like the other people who had been telling him these things, the scribes. This is actually someone who spoke and knew the message of God instead of a bunch of people who were just trying to interpret it in a very positive way towards them. Woo! There's a chapter. But now we have ended the Sermon on the Mount, 
and he's coming down from the mountain. And so we're going to be a little less dense. Again, this was a very thick part. I thought, man, this podcast is cruising along. Look at the podcast. We're getting through one through four and we're doing this. We are lay people reading the Bible. And then we hit the Sermon on the Mount, very full of teaching about how we should live. And I think that if you don't know what these things mean, get some resources. There's some very good books on the Lord's Prayer. Talk to your pastor and try to get some message in there. If you feel that you're going afoul of anything that you hear in this, don't lose heart, but go find out what it is that he's asking us to do in these three chapters. This is the manual right here on how we should live life. Boy, I bet you people were tired after the end of this day. Their minds were probably swimming. Do they even have like note paper they could take down notes? Who's in this chapter? Jesus is in the chapter. He is holding court and telling people how they should live their lives. The crowd is there. The Probably they were Pharisees and Sadducees. They were all part of the crowd, but mostly the crowd was common people. And then the apostles were there too. Some key words for us to look at or key concepts is that idea that we're going to treat other people like we want to be treated. We're not going to judge other people because maybe we have a log in our eye while we're picking on someone for having something minor. Then we're going to ask, seek, and knock for the things we want in life. God is asking us, telling us this is prescriptive, and God knows how to give the best gifts. doesn't mean we're going to get what we want or what we asked for, but he's going to get us what we need to have. And then comes the golden rule again. We're going to treat other people as we wish to be treated. The gate is narrow, so we're going to stick to the hard path, the one that leads to life. Even though we see people living an easier life, we see people living a different life than we're living, we're going to stick to that narrow path. That's the one that leads to Jesus. We're going to look out for false prophets because, again, good trees bear good fruit. Some literary tools, there's good allusions or analogies to things. For instance, when we talk about the speck and the log in the eye, obviously not literal, but meaning that you are talking to someone with a minor issue when you're having a major issue. Don't be a hypocrite. We're talking about giving holy things to dogs and pearls and things of value to pigs. We're not going to do that either. All analogies. Other literary items. Do we get grapes from a bad thorn bush? No, we get grapes from a vine. Do we get figs from thistles? Nope, thistles are a thing all by themselves. You don't get a good fig from a thistle. So you know something, again, by the fruit it gives out. We can't know what's in the heart of people, but we can see the fruit of their lives. And then at the end, we want to build our house on a rock. Another analogy to show us something we understand. We understand houses. And when we see a good house and a bad house, this is another thing where Jesus talks to us in a way we understand them. So there are some really good figures of speeches right here. What we know about God is he wants us to be authentic and he wants us to produce good fruits, but follow people who produce good fruits. He wants us to treat people like they would want to be treated. Now, the question comes in, and I think about this all the time, well, would I want someone else to tell me that I'm screwing up in my life or try to correct me in my way? Well, yeah. If you are going down the wrong path, don't you want someone to say, hey, the bridge is out. Don't go down this direction. You are going to fall off a cliff. You would want someone to tell you if you were biking on a path that had no bridge. Same thing here. You would want to tell people about Jesus, about the life everlasting, because you would hope someone would treat you that way. Don't think about what you want in a, oh, I want to live my best life. Think about what you want as what you really want. What really is important, that's where the golden rule is. And that we know that God doesn't want us to be hypocrites. He wants us to believe in the things and not just wear God as some sort of outside cloak, but in our core, in our being, produce good fruits and be that person who actually does what God says is the will of my Father. And then what does it say about human nature? I think it says when he's saying these things, shouldn't it be obvious that we sh those are the things that God wants us to do? I think it's easy now that we see Jesus for us to go back and look at places in the Old Testament and say, yeah, you know, God always meant this. People got off track. 
at some point, the belief in scripture went the wrong direction. And so God is trying to bring us back to that. And he's trying to realign us with what God wants. But God knows that we can be judgy at times, that we can treat people poorly, and that we can fall for false idols or fall for false prophets. But we tend to get attracted, like that meme where the guy's looking at the new girl. We get attracted to the newest thing on the block. And he's saying, don't do that. Stick with me here. Stay on the narrow path. Don't follow someone the wrong direction. Because you don't want to be that person that in the end, God says, I never knew you. Go away. That's a, that's a deep message there. And then the central message of the chapter are the things we just mentioned about. I'm not going to repeat it yet again. But what does God require us to do? God requires of us to live that life of righteousness where we bear good fruit, we follow his will, we treat other people well, and that we build our house on a solid ground. I'm going to meditate on these sets of good and bad things, the two gates, the two eyes, the two fathers, the two people, us and other people, the two buildings, and think about whether or not I'm going down that correct path, going through the right gate. I'm going to pray about how the people came down off the mountain and were astonished. How many times have I heard the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, most of these teachings? Was I astonished? I need to think about how I can bring back that astonishment and ask God for giving that to me again. I know I probably had it when I became a Christian. What I'm going to share to other people is I'm going to share to them what people did share to me and what I hope people will share to me. That is my goal, to send them the message of love, forgiveness, and the good news of Jesus. All right, everyone. These were dense ones. He's coming down the mountain next in chapter eight. And then we're going to learn a little bit more now that he's done with this master class on how to live our lives in a way that God wants us to live them. He is giving us the instruction manual from the man who made us. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please tell a friend about this podcast. I hope to get more people involved. I'm hoping that at some point, we got some time, that we'll build this active community that will talk about things, that will learn from each other. And so if you could tell other people about this podcast, if you think that they would enjoy going through the Bible very slowly so we can do these deep dives, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.